name is Harris Lewin. I was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1957, and I'm a professor of evolution and ecology at the University of California, Davis, a laboratory in the Genome Center and a joint appoint in the veterinary school in the Department of Reproduction and Population Health. Who got you interested in science early in life? I had a, a great chemistry teacher in medical, middle school who was really, you know, he stimulated my fascination uh, with chemistry. Uh, early on, I have to say my, my parents were very nurturing with respect to getting me interested in the natural world, particularly my dad. And, and even though we were in Brooklyn, we were on the South Shore of Brooklyn, which is, was still pretty wild in those days. And, um, and I spent a lot of time at the American Museum of Natural History as a kid and the Bronx Zoo. And um, those places very, were, I would say, most influential in my, the development of my interest in natural history and biology. Later, you became interested in studying dairy cows. How did you come to that? So very early on, uh, the, the, that was the, those were formed. Always interested in animals, mm -hmm. and uh, and and then as as I as I grew up, I I started to have more experiences uh, with agriculturally important animals, and I, I really thought veterinary medicine was my my calling. And when I had the opportunity uh, to go to Israel when I was in high, my sister emigrated and uh, moved to a kibbutz. And, and uh, I said, well, this is a great opportunity to get experience in agriculture when I, in, the early, in the 70s, you know, mid 70s. And so I, I, one summer I went and worked on a poultry farm. I liked that, uh, I thought that was fascinating. I learned a lot about raising broilers. And then uh, two years later, I, I decided I liked large animals a lot more. And I got to work with a veterinarian they're one of the most famous veterinarians in the country, large animal veterinarians, who really stimulated my interest in, in dairy cattle and uh, dairy cattle management reproduction. And I just became fascinated with, with the whole biology of, of, the, of the cow, um, you know, what they were eating and how they were converting uh, their, their diet to very, very low quality forage into high quality uh, product, uh, if you will, uh, you know, milk. And that, that was, uh, that has not gone away. I'm still absolutely fascinated by the biology of ruminants. Our recent papers uh, attest to the fact that um, this is, the, to me, one of the most important adaptations on the planet, the development of the, the rumen, this whole class of organisms, uh, and how important they've been to human civilization and um, human evolution, uh, even. Uh, so uh, those were uh, very formative experiences, actually working hands-on with the animals. And, uh, and then when I got to Cornell, uh, as an undergraduate, I, I continued and uh, started to work in the areas of animal genetics, learned about quantitative genetics and animal breeding, and uh, decided that statistical genetics wasn't really what I was interested in. I was interested in, in genetics and diseases. And that led me to UC Davis as a graduate student where I began to work on, uh, at the time, the Majestic Compatibility Complex and Genetic Resistance to Infectious Diseases. That was a very important area from the late, you know, from the early, mid-70s uh, to the, really to the mid-80s as the biology of the Majestic Compatibility Complex unfolded. And so I started to work uh, on the Majestic Compatibility Complex of cattle and I was very lucky to fall into a laboratory and onto a floor of people in the vet school who had made major discoveries on the bovine leukemia virus. And that was fortuitous because that turned out to be a model for the human T-cell leukemia viruses and even AIDS when AIDS broke when I was a graduate student. And so I received uh, many years of NIH funding to study genetic control of resistance to uh, subclinical progression of bovine leukemia virus. And, in Holstein cattle. Who were some of your key mentors in graduate school? Mentoring w was really critical. I was very lucky uh, as a graduate student at Cornell when I shifted from undergraduate to, to graduate school to have a, a new assistant professor named uh, Rod Dieter at Cornell who worked on, on onc oncodevelopmental genes in poultry. And so I learned a lot about uh, immunogenetics and um, he, he was, he was 
terrific because he allowed me a lot of freedom in the laboratory to explore and to make mistakes and to learn on my own without being uh, over, you know, without dominating every, every hour of every day. And I learned that that was the way you learned in the laboratory was by experimenting and making, uh, you know, making your own mistakes and learning from them while he provided great context for what I was doing. Uh, next was my, my PhD mentor, Domenico Bernocco, who was a, a very uh, important principal figure in the, in the elucidation of the HLA complex, discovered the HLA C locus. He was uh, one of the leading geneticists in Paul Terasaki's lab at UCLA. And uh, I inherited him by accident because I came to Davis to work for Clyde Stormont, who was the founder, a founder in the field of animal immunogenetics in blood groups and biochemical polymorphisms. And just about every person in the world who did animal genetics had come to Davis to learn from, from Stormont and his team, horse blood groups, cattle blood groups, and all other domestic animals. But I was very lucky to get Bernoco because Bernoco had been working on the MHC whereas Stormont had been working on blood groups. And so uh, falling into the MHC was a real blessing because there was a locus of genes that were clearly involved in, in, in the immune system. And, uh, and then to be working on the bovine leukemia virus, just, just luck, fell into it and uh, really took that to, to completion. You know mapped the genes, sequenced the genes, found the, the regions of the protein that were responsible for resistance and susceptibility, developed a genetic test, uh, and all of the things that followed. So it, it really was a, a beautiful story, and I was very lucky along the way to have great mentors uh, who, who provided the, the context and, 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 and great mentoring on how to approach such a complicated problem in an uninbred species. I mean, I couldn't make crosses. I had to do it almost in the human context of using, uh, you know, they, they were, they were um, not wild populations, but they were still not inbred animals either. And so it, it really was the first example of genetic control of resistance to infectious disease in a non-inbred species. And having people who understood you know, how to approach that problem like Bernoco in a non-inbred species because of all the HLA and disease association that was going on at that time. Um, that was the most valuable, le those were the most valuable lessons I learned, could possibly learn at that time. So again, lucky to be in the right place at the right time with the right people. How did the Human Genome Project impact your work? Of course, those were very exciting years. It was really the mid 80s and I had, as I mentioned yesterday, in my talk here, uh, I heard a lecture from Jim Womack, and I, I started to hear about what Steve O'Brien was doing and what Jim was doing and what a small group of others were doing with a mouse, which was really trying to develop uh, comparative maps. Uh, you know, this principle of shared synteny between uh, mammals was really pretty new, and uh, there were very few genes. We didn't even have. RFLPs in those days or ESTs in those days, they were biochemical polymorphisms primarily that you could use somatic cell hybrid mapping to demonstrate that the genes were on the same chromosome of the different species. So, so Jim was a, and Steve were very, their work was really important to me because it opened my eyes to a whole, what a whole genome what you could do with the whole genome rather than focusing on a particular locus. However important that gene was, there was so much more in, in the genome. And since I was interested in complex traits like lactation and reproduction and how those could, uh, uh, how you could map genes for, for those kinds of traits that were important economically to either the dairy cattle or beef cattle uh, industries, the, the large animals beca became a model, really, for how you approach uh, mapping genes for complex traits. So naturally, when they began to talk about the Human Genome Project and all of the techniques like RFLPs that started to come out and, um, and microsatellites, we quickly had to adopt those, those methods. And the human geneticists recognized the animal geneticists had unique 
models and things to contribute, populations to contribute, animals that had been under selection for individual traits for long periods of time. And so this was a, a natural and very exciting opportunity to put people together uh, to, to think about how we could use these new technologies that were developing out of human genetics uh, to, to benefit the you know, new genetics that was going on in domesticated animals. And so when the Human Genome Project launched, uh, that, that was a defining moment for everybody. We realized that it was possible to sequence whole genomes. We never thought when we started that we'd ever be able to raise the money to sequence, say, a cow genome or a, a pig genome or a chicken genome. We were, um, we were content with developing maps because we knew that maps would be able to give us this marker-assisted uh, uh, breeding, these marker-assisted breeding strategies. Uh, but it quickly became apparent as sequencing became uh, more, uh, you know, cost efficient that it would be possible at some point to do the sequencing of another animal genome. And the first one uh, after, first mammal after the human and the mouse and the, and, and the rat was the cow. And we were right there at the right time with the right people thinking in the right way that the cow should be the next one. Can you tell us how you began thinking of the feasibility of sequencing the cow genome? Absolutely, because um, there were many of us that felt, of course, I was involved in the mapping side, but there were many of us that felt that sequencing would be inevitable once we knew that uh, sequencing was possible, even though it cost $3 billion. We, we all began to say, well, what if we had the sequence? You know, and it didn't take that much longer uh, from 2003, uh, the, the first you know, draft of Human Genome published, uh, until the time that we started, and George Weinstock and Richard Gibbs and, um, and the NIH got together, and as well as the industry, and decided to put $50 million into sequencing the, the cattle genome. And, um, you know, that, that, that was only a period of a few years. Can you tell us more about the process of sequencing the cow genome? Who were the key figures? There were a few people that were very influential in getting the bovine genome sequencing initiative started. Jim Womack at Texas A&M University, who was the chair of the national, you know, sort of the cattle uh, genome group within USDA, he was absolutely critical. Um, there were, there was a, a group, uh, Genome Canada, there was a group in Canada that was very important. In fact, the meeting to sequence, you know, the, one of the organizing meetings was held actually in Toronto. The USDA was very critical in this. The Agricultural Research Service and the group at, at Clay Center was also very important. Steve Kappas and, and the leaders uh, at that time, um, uh, Roger Garrett's uh, Carrot Rex Road, uh, were really supporting this uh, from the USDA side. And you know, they went to, to NIH and said, you know, we can raise half the money to do this, and uh, I think NIH, you know, saw that there was great interest. There was a community that could be involved in the annotation of the genome, and um, you know, they were willing to go ahead and 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 fund some of the uh, substantial part of the sequencing to, of course, to have a, another mammal uh, to to compare at very high resolution, but also. Uh, you know, because of the impact uh, that this could have on, on agriculture. It was a, a very important coalition that, that, that allowed the bovine genome sequencing to move forward. Those were the, pretty much the key, key individuals. I didn't play uh, a tremendous role in that. Uh, yeah, yeah, my role was still, as a young, quite a young scientist, was keeping my nose to the grindstone and producing the map that eventually they used to hang the sequence on to, to really get chromosome scale assemblies. And, uh, and so, you know, I was involved in all of it from the beginning, but, uh, you know, it was a very big move, political uh, effort to get, to get, to raise $50 million at that time. That's a, that was a, a lot of money. It cost, you know, $50 million to get that done. 
And, uh, you know, what today we can do for maybe, you know, $20,000 was 50 million in those days. And uh, that was a tough job, but we got it done. And, uh, and the impact has been enormous. You argued in a 2009 paper that good sequences require good maps. Can you elaborate? Uh, you know, that paper, which we published in, in 2009, is still reverberating 10 years later. Uh, and it was, in, in a large part, um, stimulated by the kinds of things they did with the 29, where, you know, mammals, where we had lots of sequences that were just reads that couldn't be really used unless you had a reference genome, a good genome to align them to. Uh, they were just a bunch of random reads and uh, with, with no uh, possibility to assemble them into, into chromosomes. And, and for me, for the work that I was doing, again, if you're going to study chromosome evolution, you need to have contiguous sequences in, in order to do that. But it, it turned out that um, um, the, the mapping, of course, was important, but it, it was the contiguity issues because so many of the sequences when we realized and you went into those genomes were, were missing parts or they were assembled at those times incorrectly. Uh, you didn't have complete gene models if you wanted to do annotation. You didn't have, you couldn't determine whether there was a segmental duplication there. There were so many questions uh, that came up because of the quality of the assemblies. They were good for SNPs, <laughs> for single nucleotide polymorphisms, but not, and, and what you could do with SNPs, but not for much more than that. And so, um, you know, the maps were, were critical to, to us for studies of chromosome evolution and, and to study how, uh, you know, meiosis and mitosis works. And, um, and, and so none of that uh, was possible at that time. So we, we made the, the point uh, around chromosome evolution, uh, but it, it extended to, to many other uh, issues that were related to contiguity. Uh, and being being absolutely sure gene reg everything from gene regulation to to epigenomic epigenomics and and such, and um, you know we're still having this debate, and the beauty is is that the technology is finally catching up, and things like uh, you know high C and all of these scaffolding methods are now opening up. The, what we argued for is allowing the study of structural variation and the impact of structural variation on human genetic variation and any other species that you want to examine. You really need to have these highly contiguous um, uh, assemblies so that you can find all the structural you know, variants, the inversions, the, the translocations, the fusions, and the fissions, and the small things, uh, insertions, and, and deletions, and duplications. And they, they have been, we've known that they are important, but they've been very difficult to approach on a genome scale until now with these methods, these newer methods. And so uh, I think everybody said, yeah, they're important, but they're beyond our reach at this time, so we're going to focus on these other things that we can answer with the more limited assemblies that we have. But people slowly began to gravitate toward, yeah, not only is, is that important, but we think we can, we can do it. And, uh, and Vertebrate Genomes Project, for example, is really leading the way on this now with the kinds of assemblies that they're producing uh, and showing that it's possible to produce them at scale and at, at a, a reasonable cost. And, um, and that's opening up all these new areas uh, for investigation that we, we knew were important back in 2009, but could only be approached 10 years later now that we have these, these kinds of chromosome scale assemblies. What are some of the limits of the SNP studies? It was a mixture of what was, what was possible to do. And all the things that you could do with SNPs were really important to people, Very, gen just genetic variation. And that is a, a thing that, um, you know, that has led to the, to the GWAS and the whole, the entire revolution in understanding population genetic histories and, and demographics and human migration patterns and human evolution and the co-evolution of domesticated animals uh, with humans. These, these are things that were not possible without the SNPs. So they played an inc incredibly important role uh, early on. 
do you think it's important to have a reference genome sequence for every species? Yeah, I think the, the reference species, uh, a reference genome for at least for each uh, one representative of each taxonomic family will, will give us the backbone uh, that we need uh, to really understand the relationship between genotype and phenotype and how genomes evolve. Your work on the cow genome led to an important discovery which greatly impacted agriculture. Tell us about it. Right, so that, that's a very interesting story. Uh, uh, and it, was, it all happened quite by accident, just as many important discoveries do. Uh, we went back, I decided that we needed to resequence, do the first, they, these were the first resequencing of the, uh, first resequencing of the bovine genome. I'm picking two bulls, very important bulls. One of the bulls was born in 1963, and he, he had you know, hundreds of thousands of offspring in, in, in dairy cattle. And his sons became the most important sons in terms of uh, their ability to cause an increase in milk production in the, in, the, in the female population of the cows. And so his lineage was absolutely uh, critical to the development of the mod modern dairy cow. The name of that bull was Chief, Arlinda Farms Chief. And, um, and so we resequenced Chief because we wanted to look for signatures of selection over multiple generations since 1963 and if, see if we can identify those haplotypes, those parts of the region, uh, genome that were under selection. And it turned out we sequenced Chief and his sons and a few others, resequenced them using 454 technology, which was the long read technology of the day. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, these were genomes that cost us about $150,000 each to do in those days. And, you know, we, we had a, a hugely successful project in doing this. We were even able to sort out haplotypes with what we did. And that project was done and published, that those results were done and published. And I got a call from USDA one day and said, we have mapped a gene to cattle chromosome five that is clearly influencing fertility in dairy cattle. And the gene maps back to Chief. I had just moved to Davis and Kurt Van Tassel uh, called me with this problem. And he said, can you look on chromosome five to see if there's anything in this region of about 10 million, 10 million bases. There's a huge fishing expedition that could possibly the co be the cause of this, uh, you know, uh, loss of fertility. It was the gene with the biggest, it was the chromosomal region with the largest effect that they found with, you know, millions of, of records in the national dairy cattle breeding system. So I said, okay, Sure. So I called the, the postdoc who had already moved on to Wisconsin. And I said, let's, let's have a look at, at this region. Can you call up the region and let's use the, uh, you know, very simple bioinformatics tools uh, called Anavar at that time and see if we can find something in this region. Let's first find, look at all the regions, the annotated genes, so their comparative genomics comes in. Let's look at all the annotated genes, run this through and see if we can find any mutations. And within 48 hours, it took less than 48 hours from that phone call till we found a stop codon in the 11th exon of the APAF1 gene. As a, I said, this is, this is amazing. And I looked the gene up. I was immediately able to go to the, the database and find that there was a parallel mutation in mice that caused this the, uh, phenotype that was almost identical. It was basically embryonic lethal. Uh, influencing the entire development of the, um, you know, the, the notochord and the, the whole central nervous system in mice. They had beautiful pictures. And I said, you know, this has to be it. We have a truncated, we clearly have a stop codon that was truncating this, this protein. And boy, this, this is the best candidate mutation, you know, that we've seen. And then over the next, you know, few months, we were able to, to have genotyping on hundreds of thousands of individuals and uh, all of the other types of confirmatory evidence, you know, no homozygotes at the population level, uh, tracing it to another one of his sons who also you can map the loss of fertility to. And, you know, it turned out that this gene caused about a half a million abortions all worldwide. 
uh, because the, the spread, it turned out, that 12.5% of all the genes in the current Holstein population could be traced to the single bull. So eventually inbreeding will catch up with you, and inbreeding was starting to catch up with the industry at, at, at that point. And, uh, you know, these homozygotes, you, you never saw them, they were never born, but there was this clear decline in fertility along his line. So that led to a test. There was a, a commercial company, a, a company that picked up the, uh, the mutation. We didn't patent it. We just gave it to the industry, said there's an opportunity to improve, uh, you know, improve agriculture worldwide. And since then, they've been able to screen for the mutation, eliminate the mutation, and uh, you know that that mutation is no longer a problem for the industry because fertility is, you know, probably the most important trait. Because without having a calf, you you don't have milk, so it's a, a really important trait for yeah, and animal this, agriculture. Do you think genomics has led to better cattle breeding practices than the older traditional methods? Well, I don't work in this field very much anymore. I've re my my interests have completely shifted to genome evolution, but I do uh, keep up with what's going on. And, you know, this is where genomics has had a huge impact. And it has happened faster and with, with greater, I would say, greater overall impact than what has happened in the human genome with, pers with precision or personalized medicine. The technologies were very quickly adopted into a process for genetic improvement, which we call genomic selection. And, and that would never have happened without the first having the sequence and then having all the SNPs identified and having very dense SNP maps and then being able to relate quantitative traits to different parts of, of chromosomes. So this process of genomic selection is saving the industry, uh, both the dairy, all, all the agriculturally important species of animals and plants now, millions of dollars uh, because, and, and accelerating genetic improvement at a rate, uh, you know, very close to what would be predicted based on selection of individual, you know, uh, genes affecting these traits over the entire genome. It's, um, it's been transformative for the breeding industry uh, because they can dramatically reduce their costs. Um, generation, you, you can just, make genetic improvement at a much faster rate than you could previously using the statistical uh, animal breeding and plant breeding tools alone. So it was, they were the early adopters and uh, they have, that industry has recognized tremendous uh, gains because of the genomic technologies. How is genomics currently helping to address the variety of other pressing issues facing the agricultural industry? Yeah, this is a really new and very cutting edge area that you're suggesting, of course, all of the selection has been on traits of economic, uh, direct economic relevance, uh, such as milk production or components of milk or, or uh, uh, parts of the beef cattle industry uh, that are important. But now people are starting to look at things like, you know, methane production, uh, other areas of sustainability uh, that are extremely, you know, important in the, in the new environment that we're in, in terms of how these animals and how the industries will adapt to changes that are being caused by, uh, for example, for, by, by climate change. And so uh, I, think, I think, you know, this is where the emphasis needs to be. There needs to be much more a much greater understanding about how to um, to use genetic variation as it relates to uh, extreme environments, which we're seeing all over the planet. Um, there are places where it's not just temperature, but it's the insects. It's everything that comes along with the changes in climate that affect the ability to to conduct. Uh, or, you know, it, it affects the entire in industry and in turn affects in the food supply. Uh, the stability of the food supply, the safety of the food supply through, you know, the pathogens that, that can enter. And so um, this is a very active area of research. It's going on in Australia, going on in the United States and going on in other areas of the world. And um, it's very complicated. 
it's not it's not as simple as direct as selection direct because so, there's been no selection on these traits so it's not that easy to find the genes that you're actually looking for so it's a it's it's an area of active investigation and uh, one that's really important to the future how have recent developments in sequencing technology aided your work what's on the horizon you know these long read sequencing technologies and the cost of doing them has been an absolute game changer uh, for the goal of producing chromosome scale assemblies. Um, and the, it's not just the, the long reads, but it's also the, the scaffolding methods that have made a huge difference in the transition from the short reads to the long reads. And then the combination of these methodologies is really what's enabling us to get to almost telomere to telomere sequences. And um, so long read technology, I think, is, is the key. Uh, we know it's the key to contiguity. And it's, it's um, you know, if the costs, the, the costs are already at a point with the new technology, say, by PacBio, the 8 million uh, chip that they have, you know, a human genome at 60x can now be sequenced, you know, for basically on two chips. That's $2,400. Um, and so and that's a three gigabase genome. And as we're thinking about sequencing all eukaryotes, still the, 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 um, those, that's a big genome, three gigabase. I mean, the average is probably about two. And so the cost of producing high quality genomes uh, across the entire, uh, you know, eukaryotic tree of life is now, you know, it's now really in our, in our grasp. It's, it, it's, it's, it's reasonable. I think we can, you know, we, it, we can do the kinds of assemblies that were, are even better than the, you know, 2003, the, the human, primary human genome assembly. We can do that now for, you know, a couple of thousand dollars for if we want to go with that quality for each spe new species that we want to, se want to sequence. So having a reference quality genome uh, is, is, as we've heard in the last two days at this meeting, is what every scientist really wants. But, you know, it, people just did not have a way. We just did not have a, uh, a reasonable uh, a strategy to that, for doing that, until, you know, it just became cost effective and we had these new longer read technologies. How do we make sure the next generation of researchers are equipped to keep pushing genomics forward? This is where, of course, uh, training programs and these uh, looking at this from different perspectives, from NSF's perspective, from NIH's perspective. I mean, we, we need stronger training programs in, in, in technology, in, in population genomics, in evolution, uh, and in bioinformatics. There, we, we barely have the tools to scale beyond where we are today. You know, going from a couple of hundred reference quality genomes that we have now to thousands of them to tens of thousands of them will require expertise that we don't have. If we don't have the good fundamental training programs and, and be able to uh, attract people into those programs, we're not going to have the tools. We'll, we'll have the genomes before we have the tools. You know, we'll have assembled genomes, but we won't have the tools to visualize them or interrogate them uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. So the training programs are uh, inadequate in, in, my, in my view. I think we need to, to, to broaden those. I think we need to think about interagency approaches to, to training graduate students and, and postdocs. And we need to be able to do it at scale. Uh, and not in these little onesie twosie kinds of things that, that some of the funding agencies uh, have, but in, in, in larger programs uh, where, where this, it, it's only possible to train, I think, the number of people that are going to be required if you, if you do it, it. The only way to do it efficiently is to do it at scale. And, and you know, we just don't have those programs right now. Can you tell us about the Earth Biogenome Project? What gave you the idea for this ambitious project? Well, it goes back to your earlier question. Um, it, what motivated it was that I reached a, a dead end. I had no more genomes of chromosome scale that I could use to go deeper into the questions of chromosome evolution and the ancestral 
uh, organization of the ge of the mammalian genome. There were just there were eight genomes, and then there were ten genomes. And okay, you know, you could just go so far with ten with ten genomes, and 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 so that was uh, that's where that's where I realized that unless there was something we were going to be able to do at scale, uh, you know, we were not going to be able to understand uh, things at a at the level that we were we were interested in exploring. And so, you know, on a flight back from, from the UK, uh, I started to sort of pencil this out of what it would take to produce large numbers of reference genomes. All of this was inspired by the G10K, you know, the thing that Oliver Ryder and Steve O'Brien and David Hauser started. I was a founding member of that community. I was the only one advocating, uh, and with Steve was the only one supporting me for chromosome scale assemblies. Everybody wanted to do these draft assemblies. And I said, you know, we have to build it in. If you look at the founding G10K document, you'll see that we argued in there for chromosome scale assemblies. And it was the first, the first place that we did so. Uh, but they weren't being, even though it, it got, it was 2009, uh, that, that paper and that, that uh, whole thing started about that time. But here was four, five, six years later and we just weren't getting any traction. They really, it was still too expensive. We didn't have the technology. And, um, and, and then things started to change. Uh, uh, PacBio came along. And uh, so this was led to this little pencil calculations. You know, we had Illumina was, was, was there with their technology. The short read technologies were there. The long read technologies were coming along. So, you know, just penciling this out, I said, well, what would it take to do, you know, a thousand genomes? I looked at the number. I said, this is, you know, if this is what it takes, why aren't we doing this? And I started to go a thousand genomes, 10,000 genomes, a hundred thousand. Well, why not everything? And, uh, and, and then, you know, I said that number came out to like 2.7 billion. This was 2000, about 2014, 2015, you know, just based on sequencing tech costs and technology at that time. I said, this is crazy. This is doable. You know, this is actually possible to do. And so I started to talk to a few colleagues about it who were thinking about the same thing. Uh, Gene Robinson at the University of Illinois and John Kress at the Smithsonian. And, um, and we decided to put a workshop together at the Smithsonian in 2015. And uh, that's, Eric Green was there and uh, Richard Gibbs and a number of others, uh, representatives from all the agencies that are here today at this meeting. And uh, they all said, you know, you got to do a lot of work to figure out how you would do such a thing, but it's not crazy. And it, it really would be transformative if we could do it. And then we spent the two next two years trying to figure it out and eventually came up with a, a, a reasonable strategy that everyone believed, uh, you know, could work. And we published it in 2018. Here we are another year and a half later, and it's uh, turning into a, a global movement. Uh, of, of very committed people who believe that this is the best thing we could do for biology and medicine and agriculture and, and environmental science at this point in, in history. How do you see genomic sequencing affecting wildlife conservation? Having the sequence is the first thing that everyone is going to want to do. We just heard from Beth Shapiro and, and, and her talk. I mean, you could sequence a single individual and you could look at runs of homozygosity, long stretches uh, where uh, you find no variation, and uh, and there's already been demonstrated a correlation between um, stretches of homozygosity in the genome and their risk for extinction. Uh, so I think as a first step, this is what this is what will be done for every species because if there's lots of existing genetic variation, uh, you have some very reasonable tools at. Uh, uh, strategies already in hand for how you would manage that by you know moving breeding individuals and, and and that sort of thing but if you have a population that seems to be a great risk because of its almost absence of of uh, a variation you know you might you me the might say it's functionally extinct already or you might have to take very different measures uh, and and uh, to try and and conserve that species and, and so there are decisions that will be made based on what we will find out uh, in, about genomes, uh, you know, what variation still exists in, in, in individuals and at the population level. And uh, those, those uh, 
that information will be absolutely critical to the decisions on which species you're going to try and conserve in their natural habitats, which you might move to uh, confined, uh, you know, breeding for perhaps reintroduction at a, a future date. And uh, you know which ones you might uh, move individuals from different isolated populations to increase variation. Those are the ways uh, that the information will ultimately be used. Can you give us some examples of how sequencing is already impacting conservation? You know, again, uh, Oliver Ryder's efforts uh, with the uh, northern white rhino, which is basically functionally extinct, and uh, there's only a few individuals left, and so in radical decisions are being made about how to conserve that species. Uh, but there's everything in between. Uh, you know, we heard about Florida panther today, uh, and we've seen the impacts of introduction of new genetics and new genetic variation into that population to stabilize it, and now that population is thriving. Um, uh, and there's a whole host of species that are sort of at that at that point, and many of which we know about, and many of which we don't know about. And so that's what I think one of the beauties uh, is of the, of the Earth Biogenome Project, is we're immediately going to be able to access that, even through the single individual. If we can get, you know, haplotype phased assemblies, we're going to be able to see stretches of homozygosity, and, you know, and, and just understand, you know, how much variation actually exists. Even if it's from a single individual, it should be a mirror into what, the, what is happening in the general population. And if we do what we propose in the Earth Biogenome Project, which is to get at the genetic variation by population sample of at least 10 individuals uh, and with a good reference genome, we're really going to have a pretty good handle on where those, those species are with respect to their risk for uh, extinction. How have you built a research community around the Earth Biogenome Project? The project in itself, the vision of the project itself, is highly motivating. Uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing that the young people who, who write to me almost every day from around the world are, are totally captivated, you know, by the vision of sequencing everything. So they're not constrained. You know, they don't ask the same questions that you'll hear, say, at this meeting. They just say, how can I be involved? I, I think this is terrific. I, I, I want to be involved in this project. Who can I go study with? Do you have funds? Uh, to do this kind of thing. And uh, so, uh, you know, these, you know, we have to engage uh, scientists uh, and, and young people uh, and the public. This is a project that, that is not just about, you know, trained PhDs and, and, and people in, in science. It's about engaging the entire planet really, in this initiative, because we won't be able to collect the samples. We won't be able to do many things unless the public active, actively engages in what we're trying to do. To answer your question directly, the project is, is building its community through the, it's a network, global network of networks. So it's tying together all of these groups that are working on specific taxonomic groups of organisms, you know, whether it be insects or microbial eukaryotes or vertebrates, and putting everybody under a common framework. And, and so the, the community engagement comes in just the way the governance of the project is, is organized. We have representatives from all of those communities, and those communities are tied to everything from, uh, you know, groups of people who are interested in specific taxonomic groups to individuals who are interested in a specific species. And, and so this thing just kind of spreads and grows organically. Uh, in, in, in a way that is just, you know, draws people in because anytime you have an organism that has an interesting biology, today everybody wants to have its, its genome sequenced. And so this is, uh, it's not very difficult to build communities when you have that kind of uh, pull across the entire, you know, the entire living world uh, uh, and uh, across biology where, where there are so many organisms being looked at, like you said, I think before, you know, it's no longer, is this a model, you know, or every organism in this itself is a, model, is, is a right. model in itself <laughs> and for everything else because everything is, is connected. So uh, this is a, a very, uh, I think, a very motivating uh, vision for many people. Uh, and uh, I think this is only going to grow as the project, you know, really gets off the ground. What for you was the most surprising legacy of the Human Genome Project? Well, the, the thing that's most surprised me is the speed in which the technology has 
enabled us to to create resources and ask questions that we never thought we'd be able to ask. And if the end product is these high quality genomes, reference quality genomes, if we can produce them, they are, that is, that, it turns the question right. It's the infrastructure for the future of biology because any questions can be answered by having reference quality genomes. Uh, you know, and if you do it and you include the high C and you include the epi, epigenomics components, epigenetic marks and so on, you really have a resource that will last for a long time into the future. And I think that's the, you know, that's, that's something that we all, I think, want to see happen. Uh, it's a great legacy because these species are disappearing at a rate in which we also would not have predicted even five years ago, the acceleration in, in the extinction rates. We're in the sixth mass extinction. We could lose 50% of the species on the planet by the end of the next century. Um, you know, what the, the consequences are for us and the rest of life on Earth, uh, nobody knows, but we're starting to see, you know, in these uh, accelerated extinction patterns. And, and, and so I think, you know, really looking forward from there to answer, answer your question, uh, you know, most surprising thing is the speed we, we've been able to, to be able to do this. Now we need to figure out how to do it. And then we, we need to focus our efforts on what we can do with the information that once we, once we get it. And this is where, you know, Beth's ideas and people, things that people don't really want to talk about because it's sort of at the fringe, like, uh, the extinction. People don't want to really talk about it, but it's, you know, if we have the code, it's almost Michael Crichton, you know, it's, it's almost Jurassic Park. If we, if we have the code, we just believe in, you know, if we believe in our ability to change the future, we know if we have the code of everything, the, the true book of life, the digital sequence, the library of everything that exists on the planet, we don't know what the future holds and, and, and we don't know what technologies are going to be there, but we know if we have that digital information, that's, we have a record of that species and what we can do with that in the future, um, you know, could be very important to the survival of our descendants. And so, you know, I, I urge people not to dismiss it as science fiction because what we're doing today would have been viewed as science fiction 20, when the Human Genome Project started. Thank you.